I don't know who the link is. Where's the link? Refresh. Yeah, we're going to live stream a presentation. I'm presenting on uh, the different types of bio signals and machine learning in MATLAB. So if you want to learn about that, you're welcome to stay, but I know you guys I know want to they're, plan to do a travel They're pretty the hungry, place. so I want to make sure that they get food. But, I mean, you are certainly welcome to stay if you want to. Uh, okay, I sent it to myself. I will make a post now. It should be good. It should be good to go. All right, I'm going to wait like two minutes, and then I'm going to get started. Yeah, several times more. More people in this group than we said. Eric, just let me know when you get that posted. Yep, I'm going to do that right now, and then we'll be all set to go get food or whatever you want to do. Um, Gmail. HMC. Forest. Alrighty. All right. All right, cool. Thank you. And I'll watch it later, okay? Yeah, sure. It. No problem. Alrighty, so, so uh, you're already good either. Yeah. It's fair. What's up? So let's uh, get started, I guess. Uh, Bob, do you want to come over here or I know you've been talking all over the place. Here. So these are the hands that we're gonna have. Alright, so uh, can I get started? I'm gonna just put this in present mode. So I'm going to be talking a bit about machine learning with EEG, EOG, and EMG in MATLAB. Uh, so just to kind of like proceed a little bit forward, let's talk a little bit about some basic anatomy terminology first. Uh, so the first thing that you really want to know is like these are the different kinds of like planes that exist for like how we discuss the human body. So when you say something is frontal, that means like it's, it's in the front, right? Alternatively, you could say something is posterior that's behind you, right? So anterior is in front, posterior is behind. Okay, so it's like the, kind of the thing to remember. Uh, in general, this is anatomical position. If you have your hands open facing forward and extended downward, so that's your anatomical position. Uh, so in general, when you say anterior, that means it's the open face of your hand, as opposed to the back of your hand. Proceed a little bit forward. Um, so we talked about this a little bit during Abby's presentation. Uh, but the gist is that the skull consists of a number of different components, right? We have the skin, then underneath that there's like the layer of fat and adipose tissue, and then beneath that there's muscle, and that muscle produces EMG that you pick up when you try to re uh, record EEG signal. So that'll actually create some noise, and I'll get a little more into that later. Uh, but then underneath that there's the skull, and beneath the skull there is this kind of like thick layer that wraps around the outside of the brain, it's called the dura. So there's the dura mater, then there's the arachnoid space, and then there's the PMI or over the brain. And I'll kind of talk a little bit more in detail about that, but this is kind of like a rough kind of figure of what that's expected to look like. So you see like there's the skull, there's the dura mater, the arachnoid matter, and then kind of in the arachnoid matter there is like blood vessels and such that connect to the brain, so that's like where the blood supply for the brain is. Uh, additionally, the CSF kind of flows through that space and it will go through the arachnoid villi to get into the, uh, into the arachnoid spaces within the brain. So that way it can provide like oxygen, et cetera, to keep the brain functioning. Uh, and then that's the PM otter and then the brain. So when you do like a, an, an invasive brain computer interface, usually you go in at this layer, you'll go through the PM otter into the brain itself to create these sorts of implants. So to kind of like talk about like what the problems you'll experience when working with biosignals, uh, in general, you have really small signals. You really need to amplify them up to be able to see them. Uh, sometimes the signals can be as small as nanovolts if you're looking for like very specific information. Uh, but in general, most of the time it's between millivolts and microvolts. Um, so you shouldn't have to be uh, worrying about things that small. Uh, nonetheless, though, you can get more accuracy and more information if you can get higher precision. So there are a couple of devices like OpenBCI is capable of doing nanovolts 
with uh, the Wi-Fi module. So if you want to get that, then you would want to make sure that the Wi-Fi module is functioning for those recordings. You can also record faster with it that way. Um, another thing to think about is because we're working with signals that are kind of further away from where the electrode is, you have to worry about the distance because remember, voltage falls off squared with distance. So as a result, if you are recording from the outside of the brain, like at the surface of, let's say, the, the scalp, then you have to record through all of those layers that we talked about before. And so as a result, you have this big separation between the electrode and the brain. So they're capacitively coupled and inductively coupled, etc. So we can kind of talk a little bit about that if you want to, but for, for the most part, let's just think of this as they're wirelessly connected. And another thing to think about is that because of this distance, the signals are very small, and so noise tends to be roughly the same magnitude, if not larger, than the signal that you're trying to look at. And so as a result, it becomes very important to filter everything that you're recording so that you only get what you're looking for. Another thing is that because of that, certain signals can disguise other signals. So EMG, for instance, could appear when you're trying to record EEG, and then that could distort what you think you're trying to observe. EOG, from your eyes, can also distort that. So when you blink, you'll see a big jump in the EEG. And then that could ruin your algorithm's accuracy, too, because you may not necessarily know, oh, I have a bunch of these blinks in here. I should have removed those first. So that's why you usually you filter that out or you do independent components analysis. And we'll talk a little bit about that, um, but that's kind of outside the scope of this presentation. So in general, there are two problems you have to be worried about with biosignals. It's getting a good signal, and then after that, extracting information from that signal that is meaningful to your application. So let's kind of talk about the different types of biosignals that we'll be concerned with. Uh, and for the most part, we're really going to only be concerned with electrooculography, electromyography, and electroencephalography. So that's EOG, EMG, and EEG. So for the first thing, we're going to talk about EMG. Uh, in general, uh, what you're going to want to do if you're recording from the surface of the skin is look for superficial muscles. So we kind of talked a little bit about like superficial and deep here. Uh, in general, things that are more internal are considered deep and things that are considered more external are called superficial. So if you want to find muscles that you want to record from, I recommend that you look for larger muscles. So you can see like the extensor digitorium is, is fairly large towards like the back of the forearm. Uh, and you can see that that should be fairly straightforward for you to place an electrode across to be able to record something on it. Uh, in general, the voltage will propagate from the like center of your body outward and so you'll see that if you put an electrode on one part of the muscle and then another one further down from the muscle, then you'll see that the voltage is higher at the electrodes closer to your center when you have an event occur. Uh, this is also part of the reason why you need to have a, uh, a common mode uh, noise rejection because, as you can see, there's a lot of muscles in that region, and there are also muscles that are deep in that region underneath those other muscles. As a result, you end up with that crosstalk problem that we were talking about earlier. And that creates issues when you're trying to identify the effects of one muscle. So as a result, if you want to be able to record the specific muscle that you are over, then you need to get a common voltage from that skin region that you can use to remove that from both the electrodes to get more accuracy on that difference between those two points. And so that's why you put an electrode usually on a bone somewhere near that site. So let's say I'm recording on my forearm, then I may want to put an electrode on my like elbow around the electronon, which is like that part that's like the bony kind of part on your elbow. Uh, alternatively, if you're closer to your hand, you may want to use the, uh, the bone on your ulna that extends uh, sort of like outward. There's like a little protruding uh, bone that you can feel at the kind of corner of your wrist, and that is another good location to use as a ground. So to kind of proceed a little bit forward, um, so the muscles that cause your hand to flex, to basically form a fist, uh, those are called your flexors, and the muscles that cause your, uh, or sorry, the muscles that cause your uh, hand to, to open are you're called your extensors. So in general, if you want to look for muscles that control those specific things, search for extensor something something, and usually that will find you the extensor muscles for that region. Uh, in general, muscles are named kind of based upon function and where they attach and what bones they're near. 
So for instance, there could be like the extensor ulnaris is near the ulna, which is a bone in your forearm. So there are a couple of examples of this. Or, or extensor radialis is something that's towards the outside. It's closer towards your thumb. So if you're looking for specific muscles that control specific actions, usually if you do a search for what muscle does this, then you can usually find it. Usually I would recommend you search flex or extend along with that, so that way you can find the specific muscle associated with the direction that you're looking to do. Because muscles can only pull, they can't push. So they don't do bidirectional, they only do one direction. So another thing is EMG is a voltage. So you're reading a voltage off of the surface of the muscle. That voltage is produced when your muscle is stimulated by the neurons that are kind of interspersed into that muscle. And so as a result, that's why you get higher voltages closer to you initially, because the neurons first are able to stimulate that region before they can stimulate the further regions. So that's why you get that kind of like pulse train of sorts. So to kind of proceed a little bit forward, uh, like I was saying, the signals for the EMG is usually around the order of microvolts to millivolts. And generally speaking, you have frequencies on the order of 1 hertz to 25 hertz that are of the most interest. But all of your meaningful information for EMG is generally going to be under 150 hertz. So my recommended filtering for this is you're going to want to remove any DC noise or DC kind of shifts in your EMG because that's just going to be like a shift upward from your baseline. And that's not really going to give you any meaningful information about what the EMG is doing. Uh, if you really want to know what the EMG is doing, all you really need to know is the AC information, so like certain frequencies. Uh, and so that's why you'd wa probably want to use a high-pass filter for about 0 0.03 hertz, so that way you can keep most of that information. And a low-pass filter for around 100 to 150 hertz is usually sufficient. So like, let's say you're sampling at 200 hertz. You can't really filter out 150 hertz signals. The most that you could do is filter out 100 hertz signals. So in that case, 100 hertz is usually sufficient. Uh, it depends on what device you're using to record. In our case, we have the Open VCI uh, kits, so they recorded around 250 hertz. So the most that you could do is filter under 125. So that said, kind of moving a little bit forward, there are a couple of different machine learning models that have been found to be quite effective with EMG. Uh, it depends what application you're looking at. But if you're looking to solve problems with regards to sequence, you want to predict what someone's going to do, then a hidden Markov model or a time delay neural network is usually pretty effective. Uh, but there have been a number of other successful methods. In particular, support vector machines have been stated to be very effective with this. Uh, another one is Gaussian mixture models and linear discriminant analysis. Uh, in general, like linear analysis of this rather than quadratic or cubic analysis is, is sufficient for EMG. Uh, but you can try it out with a couple of other methods depending upon what features you choose to use. Uh, so are there any questions about EMG? All right, cool. Uh, we'll move on to EOG. Uh, so it is actually unknown where the signal for EOG comes from. Uh, people do not really know whether it's caused by the muscles inside of the eye, which you can kind of see in this figure, or if they're caused by a polarization where at the front of the eye there is one type of charge, and then at the back of the eye there's a different charge. Uh, a lot of people will give you kind of differing opinions. For the most part, people seem to be leaning towards this kind of dipole model of the eye, where there's a charge in the front and a charge in the back. I personally don't think that makes very much sense. I think it makes more sense to consider that there are muscles that are within the eye that are contracting and causing polarity to appear in the outside region of the eye. It's similar to EEG, right? You're recording through the skull. So in this case, you're just recording through the eye socket, the voltages that are being produced by the eye muscles. So I, that's personally what I believe the case is, but the literature is kind of inconclusive on this. So to kind of proceed a little bit forward, this is an example of recording positions. So if you wanted to record EOG data, you put the positive electrode above the eye and the negative electrode beneath the eye. You're going to want those to be as close to the edge of the eye socket as possible. So that way, like if, if I'm right and it is the muscles, you're going to want to be able to pick up that change in the muscles. And you should be able to very clearly see a spike up and a spike down when you look up and down for that vertical electrode. For the horizontal, you'll want the positive to be right next to the eye and the negative to be on the side of the other eye. So if you wanted to do this for both eyes, you would just flip those for each recording. So if you wanted to know where both eyes were looking, let's say you wanted to be able to tell if someone was looking into the center of their face or something, which is not likely, 
then you can do it that way. Uh, but for the most part, if you want to predict the direction of both eyes, usually they both move in the same direction. So one eye's EOG is sufficient to predict the direction for both eyes. And another thing to think about is um, like how we actually go about finding information from the EOG. So as I mentioned before, with EOG, it's very similar to EMG in that you have kind of similar frequencies present, but there are actually very specific frequencies that have been found to have the most information about EOG. So one to two hertz for down movement of the eye, two to four hertz for moving to the right with your eye, four to eight hertz for up direction with your eye, and eight to 16 hertz for left. Now, left seems to have a little bit of a lower kind of association with that frequency band. So I personally tried to change up that frequency band a little bit to get a little bit more accuracy. So I have kind of a different set of recommended frequency bands for you to use, uh, kind of different from the literature, but they're fairly similar to the bands that have been provided in the past. So the reason why I provide this is because when I personally did some machine learning on EOG using this method, I found myself getting around 95 to 98% accuracy pretty much consistently all the time. And that's even on real-time data. So in general, I would recommend these frequency bands. And I'll, I'll be providing this presentation also for everyone to look at afterwards. But in general, this is a fairly effective uh, frequency band setup to find features for the EOG. Uh, another thing to think about is EOG can sometimes pick up EEG. So if you put that vertical electrode too high, you'll pick up the frontal lobe and you'll end up with a bit of noise from that. Or the EMG, when you move your face around, like if you scrunch or furrow your brow, or if you like tighten your lips or something, etc., then the zygomasticus muscles and such in your face could sometimes distort the EOG as well. So you kind of have to be considerate of that and make sure that your subject is being uh, fairly calm while you're doing your recordings if you want to make sure that your EOG is accurate. Oh, and another thing, actually, before I proceed, um, you should always verify your signal quality before you kind of continue to do recordings for the EOG. So basically, once you have your electrode set up, run it in some sort of signal recorder to see what the signal looks like and make sure that you can clearly differentiate when you look up, down, left, and right. If you can't see that there is a movement in the electrodes, then that means that your signal setup is not correct. You may want to move the electrodes around. Once you've verified that, then you can proceed forward. Then the algorithm I personally found most effective for these was bad to trees. Uh, but there have been a number of approaches. SVMs have been effective in pretty much all biosignals, so you're perfectly welcome to use those as well. Uh, and Pinheiros Neighbors is actually quite effective with EOG as well. So to kind of move on to the OpenBCI, so by default, the OpenBCI has the following electrodes connected. We have FP1, FP2, C3, C4, T5, T6, O1, and O2. <coughs> uh, the letter in front of this actually has special meaning. So O is the occipital lobe, so that's like the region for like visual observations. Uh, T is the temporal, so it's like more associated with like sound and, and uh, words and such. And then C is more associated with information related to the somatosensory cortex. And if you're looking for information about like pr frontal processing, then the F electrodes are the FP electrodes. Uh, FP is like prefrontal, so it's like in front of the frontal lobe. So there's it, it like information about like higher level processing in that region. Uh, but another thing to think about is that the open uh, BCI is capable of higher frequencies of recording when you have the Wi-Fi uh, setup attached. Currently, we don't have that working on this computer, but we're working on it. So something to think about is trying to get that set up in the future so that way you can get much higher sampling rates. Uh, another thing is that the open BCI was designed using the 1020 electric placement system. There's a couple of different electric placement systems that exist. Uh, the one on the left is the electrode placement system the OpenBCI uses. This is the 1020 system. This is designed based upon certain percentages along the skull for separation for each of these electrodes. And so that's how this is, is uh, set up. Basically, you measure the distance from like the top of the ear from one side of the head to the top of the ear on the other side, and you measure from the bridge of the nose, the nauseon, to the occipital uh, uh, protuberance in the back of the head. So if you feel on the back of your head, you just like put, put your hand on the back of your head and you feel for like a little bone protruding from the back. Can you, can you feel it? So that, that is what's called the external occipital protuberance and that is what is known as the imion. So that's the back point of the head. So you measure your, your percentages using those two as reference points. So in the 1010 system, you have a much higher uh, electrode resolution. You may actually notice something interesting about all these examples, that they're not in numerical order along the head. And there's a reason for that. Um, 
it, basically the way it works is you have an electrode on one side, and then on the opposite side you have the, uh, the next electrode, let's say, or the electrode that would be in that sequence. The reason for this is that all electrodes on one side of the head are odd, the left side of the head are, are odd electrodes, the right side of the head are all even electrodes. So C3 is on the left side, C4 is on the right side. So you can get a sense for which side something is on if you know which electrode it is. And then as of late, there have been like even higher resolution EEGs that have been coming out called like the, the MCN system. But it's kind of less important because we don't really have access to that. Uh, but if you ever want to get into like higher end EEG, that, that will be something you may want to explore. So a big problem with EEG, everyone loves to say, you know, there's alpha band, beta band, mu rhythms, delta rhythms, infralow, delta, delta rhythms, low alpha, high alpha, low beta, high beta. No one really has any consistent definitions for what these frequency bands are. And part of it is that there's a lot of problems associated with this kind of measurement of specific frequencies. Uh, namely, uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, but if your sampling rate is different, you can observe different frequencies. And so, as a result, if you want to be able to observe the same frequency band, your time of recording may differ between different recording devices. So as a result, you may not have exactly the same frequency bands available to you with a given recording device. And so as a result, the consistency between different literature papers has been very inconsistent. Uh, nonetheless, though, because the bands are fairly similar, like they'll be like 8 to 12, or then they'll be like 9 to 13, or 9 to 12, you know, like there, there's like a little bit of variation in like the start and end points of specific bands, and whether they divide a band to high and lows, so like low beta, high beta, low alpha, high alpha. Uh, but the general gist is that there isn't a consensus. However, uh, one thing that's been interesting uh, that has been presented as of late is that in EEG, a lot of the times they'll also include up to 250 hertz of different frequencies because it's believed that EEG may have higher level processing occurring up to that frequency and that lower frequencies uh, may not contain all of the information that we may want to know. Uh, however, this idea has been presented multiple times in the past and so it's unsure whether this is actually the case or if this is just simply a case of some people finding some specific cherry-picked information. So it's kind of still questionable whether this is the case. Uh, nonetheless, it was presented as a keynote at the most recent uh, Neural Interfaces Conference, so it's quite likely that this is in fact the case. Uh, another thing is that EEG electrode placement, as I mentioned, is dependent on percentages of the uh, distance around the skull. So if you have a constant sized uh, EEG cap, like our open BCI, uh, you may not have exactly the correct position for something if a person's skull is a different shape or different size. Uh, so you could expect that the signals may vary a little bit, so that's why you may end up with some variance between recordings. So it's always good to record on a number of different people, so that way you can make sure your algorithm is robust to those slight differences in position. Um, another thing is that reference positions for the electrodes, uh, when you record a given EEG signal, you pick a certain electrode, let's say C3, and then you measure it either relative to the center point, so like CZ, would be what it's called, or you can measure it relative to all the other electrodes and take an average of those. That's called the Laplacian. Uh, this is like spatial averaging and like spatial filtering stuff. It's fairly complicated. It's not always necessary, but it can be helpful if you want to get more specific information or if you want to know specifically what's happening in that lobe and not anywhere else. Because a lot of times, as I mentioned, on EEG, you can pick up the signals from nearby regions because they're also reasonably close to that electrode. So it's at least necessary to do like a moving average relative to the electrodes next to the electrodes that you're working with if you want to get some more meaningful information out of it. Uh, however, we do not currently have that implemented for the EEG code that is currently available for us. So to kind of proceed a little bit forward, EEG is especially important that you remove noise. There's a number of different sources from that. So there's mains. So if you have this connected to a wall uh, or a battery even, sometimes there's a frequency that's associated with that and you're going to want to filter that out. Another thing is lights in the room, uh, and it turns out produce a signal of a reasonably equivalent magnitude, and different lights have different frequencies associated with them, so it's important you know what kind of light is in your room if you want to be able to filter that signal out. Most of the time, those frequencies are above 100 hertz, so if you do a low pass for 100 hertz, it's usually enough to get rid of it. But if you're interested in that 150 or 250 hertz kind of frequencies that have been discussed in the literature, then you may want to figure out what lights you have in your room. Nonetheless, 
Uh, as I mentioned, there are nearby brain regions. EOG can sometimes be picked up on the EEG, and it's actually very easy to see it. Uh, it'll look like a big jump oscillation. It's going to be way bigger than your EEG signal. And so the EOG, uh, in general, it's a good idea to filter that out. Usually a 3, pass, uh, three hertz uh, high-pass filter is sufficient to get rid of most of those blinks, but in some cases it's not. So you can use what's called independent components analysis. And we'll kind of talk a little bit about that. Uh, furrow in your brow creates EMG in your forehead, so it'll mess with your frontal lobe region uh, electric recordings. And then there's Johnson noise. So if the temperature in your room or the humidity changes, then that could affect your signal recording as well. Uh, but in general, I would not expect that to be a huge thing of importance because most people are going to be inside of a given building, and most buildings have certain standards they have to keep about the humidity and temperature requirements. So as long as your uh, room meets those requirements, it should still be fairly consistent between rooms. So there's a number of different known algorithms that have been used and some important features for EEG. A uh, hidden Markov model has been used for sequence prediction to try to guess what someone might be thinking. Uh, KNNs, SVMs, QDA, and TDNNs have been used to do classification and regression of EEG. Uh, if you're looking to do specifically algorithms that are going to have some dependence on the like, time spectrum, so like the temporal aspect of EEG, like to say someone's changing what they're thinking about, then there are a couple of things that are recommended. CNNs is another example, so I'm, I'm sure you may be familiar with those. Uh, or other types of neural networks have been very commonly used for this. Uh, but time delay neural networks in particular have been noted for their special dependence upon time and the temporal features of different biosignal recordings to be able to produce more accurate classifications, as have hidden Markov models. Yes? Uh, like, uh, I have a community at 1 o'clock. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're almost there. So Fourier transform powers, Hjorth parameters, wavelet packet transform, all of these have been noted as being useful features for EEG. And so uh, since you'll be having a copy of this presentation, I'm not really going to get into what they are or how they work, but the gist is that you can look into the literature and they'll explain how you do each of these. And they're all going to give you some meaningful information, some of them more meaningful than others. You can look at the review of the literature, they'll explain which ones are more useful. So this is kind of how the machine learning process works. Uh, some of you may have seen this before. You basically, you take your raw EEG signal. If you're only going to use the C3 and C4 electrodes, you select those channels. Then you pre-process, you filter out the information you don't want, or you use independent components analysis. And then you extract your features, like the Hjorth parameters or the power spectral density, etc. And then you do feature selection. So you can do that a number of different ways. I haven't really got, got into that yet, but I'm going to kind of get there in a second. Uh, and then you, you basically divide your features that you've selected into your training set and your test set. And then you classify it and you produce your output, or you do regression and you produce your output. So in terms of pre-processing, as I mentioned, 3 hertz high pass will remove most blinks. Independent components analysis is necessary to get the best artifact removed. Feature scaling is incredibly important. Always scale your features between your minimum and maximum of your training set, to be specific because you want to make sure that it's consistent with regards to your test set, so that way your test set is scaled the same way that your training data is. So that way your algorithm will classify it correctly. Another thing is it's best for features that have similar distributions. So one thing you can do is use the Box-Cox transform or the Johnson transform to make your data unskewed. But you don't have to do that, it's usually unnecessary. So as far as removing features, doing feature reduction, there are a couple of approaches you can take. You can take your data and you can just analyze it in a statistical program or do some statistics on it to see, oh, is the mean actually different between these two classes? If it's not, then we don't need the mean. We can use different features, right? So you basically look at the features and you decide, is it important or not? And then the alternative is you can do a brute force method using what's called neighborhood components analysis, and you just throw it all in a machine learning algorithm and see if it gets better when you train it using specific features. And so you can either remove one feature at a time and check, or you can add one feature at a time to see what level of accuracy you get improved with each feature. And then you pick the features that improve the accuracy the most, or remove the ones that improve the least. So as far as data splitting is concerned, you want to use 75% of the data for your training and your cross-validation. Usually 10 volts cross-validation is sufficient. And then 25% of that data you should save for the test set. Make sure you have equal proportions of the different classes that you're classifying in your training and your test set. So if I have 
15 samples, let's say I'm using 66% for my training and 33% for my test set, then I need to make sure that five of those samples from each class are in the test set, and then 10 of those samples from each class are in my training set. So that way I can verify that there's equal proportions, and then the test set will tell me an actual correct accuracy. The two biggest problems in machine learning is the trade-off between underfitting and overfitting. If your model is making too many assumptions, that like you have a linear model, then you're going to end up with too much bias and your model will not get high accuracy. If you have too high dimensionality for your, for your algorithm, that means it's like you have too many features, too many classes, or your data is poorly recorded, or you don't have enough data, so you didn't account for the variance well enough, or maybe you only recorded from a certain group of people, and so you don't get the full distribution of all the different changes that occur, then you end up with overfitting. And so as a result, your algorithm will not work generalizable for multiple people. But in general, you want to be somewhere in between the two. So if you improve underfitting, you end up with more overfitting. If you improve overfitting, you get more underfitting. So really, you want to find kind of a fine line in between the two that gets you the best accuracy on the training and the test set. And that's how you verify your accuracy for your algorithm. And any questions about that? So this is kind of an example of applying these techniques. In an EEG, this is an example of an EOG artifact. Uh, it's kind of scaled out. So this is over the course of 0.4 seconds. And you can see that there's this big jump and then a big drop. So if I run this through these filters, so you can see this filter here is a 60 hertz filter. So it's designed to remove the mains noise, so like from the wall or from like different power line noise. And then this filter down on the bottom here is designed to remove the DC offset. So you can see it falls off towards zero hertz. And you can see that I also did a low pass for around 100, 125 hertz to remove any of the other higher frequencies. And so the result, as you can see, the EOG is basically gone. It's pretty much flat, comparatively speaking. And you keep all of this kind of oscillation from the AC part of the signal that you want it to keep. This is the fast Fourier transform of a bunch of different examples of the signal. You can see there's a big spike here, and then that gets way smaller in the post filter. So now in EOG, this is an example of full through. You did your feature extraction and everything with EOG. So these are those frequency bands that I mentioned before. In this case, I recorded with 256 hertz instead of 250 hertz. Uh, so I have slightly more frequencies in my last band. It doesn't really change the effects very much. So after I extract all my features, I then scaled them to min-max. You can see that they're roughly the same magnitude, kind of range between all the features. And then after that, I did near neighborhood components analysis, basically the brute force approach to select which features I wanted to keep. So I first tested to see without fitting the model to see how accurate my model could be. And I could see that there's very high error but then after doing some fitting without regularization, which all that does is it prevents significant overfitting and it controls the size of your parameters for your algorithm, uh, you can see that it has a much significant decrease in the error. And so there's a, there's a need to do neighborhood components analysis. So basically, when you do NCA, you first verify, is it necessary? The, does doing NCA, is it going to help you? And if it doesn't, then there's no reason to go through the process because it takes a long time. This can take hours to run NCA. Uh, depending upon how large your data set is. So then the next thing you're going to want to do is figure out what your regularization parameter is. So you basically run the algorithm for multiple values of your regularization parameter. You just like pick a bunch of different values for lambda, and you say, all right, which one gives me the highest uh, like reduction in my error? So you can see that this one has the lowest error. It's like close to like 0.01 or 001 in this case for error. And so this is the lambda that I chose. And you can see that when I run the algorithm multiple times that I get under 2.5% error most of the time. And so after I've done that, I then use the output from neighborhood components analysis to get a weight of importance of every feature. So this tells me which features are how important. So the features up here, these are the more important features, these are the less important features, and these are the least important features. And basically what you do is you choose a threshold. You say, all right, at what point do I want to say this is random chance, this feature is not important to me. So what I did was I took the variance of the values of each of these over multiple runs of the algorithm, and I said, okay, well, the highest variance I get for these is 0.4. So anything with a value that is under 0.4, I'm removing from the algorithm because it's, it's, it's likely due to random chance that it's doing anything. And so I remove those, and I end up with just these. And so these are the different values that I chose. I kept all of the FFT bins. You can see they were all important. 
and then the RMS value, the mean and the standard deviation of the signals as well turned out to be important. And so this is the classification accuracy of the algorithm without principal component analysis. Have you heard of principal component analysis? So basically what that does is it takes your features and then it creates a bunch of linear combinations of those features. And the result of PCA is that you end up with fewer features than you originally had because it combines them and creates new features from them. And so the result is that your algorithm should run faster, should classify faster, and if you scaled your features properly, it should have a similar accuracy. It might be a little bit less because like, you don't have as much specificity. But the nice thing about PCA is your algorithm is faster, and in some cases, you can use this to verify the accuracy of your algorithm without PCA. So if, if you run your algorithm without PCA, and then you do it with PCA, and you find that the PCA has a really bad reduction in your accuracy, that means you didn't scale your features properly. So basically what that tells you is you need to go back and look at your feature scaling and improve that and fix it first. So, but you can see that when I did this with PCA, my accuracy was still high, around like 90, 93% for the EOG. And then that this tells me that my feature scaling was acceptable. To proceed forward, I did this on my test set without PCA. And you can see that almost all of the signals were correctly classified for like up, down, left, right. And then the same thing was true with PCA. In fact, in some cases, it was even better with PCA because it was preventing overtraining as well. And so that's pretty much it for your kind of like ML boot camp. So in MATLAB, really, this is as simple as you take your feature matrix and you open up the classification toolbox, you grab that matrix that has all your features in it, and you make sure that there's a column at the end that has your classes in it, and you just run the different algorithms that you have in the classification toolbox if you want to do this in MATLAB. An alternative is you can just write the algorithm yourself and use the data that you've collected in that feature matrix. And that's pretty much the gist of it. So, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know how much you guys know about regression, but trying a bunch of different learning rates tends to be the only approach to find a solution for things. So it can keep people up at night a lot of the times. And if you don't do a good job, then this will happen to you too. So that's pretty much the gist of it. Uh, thank you guys for uh, attending or listening to the talk, and uh, hopefully we'll have another interesting one coming up next week.